My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. This podcast is sponsored by Podbean. Podbean is the easiest way to create your own podcast. We here at Euripides Humanities, we use Podbean. So download the free Podbean podcast app to start, record, and publish your very own episode in minutes. Podbean provides you everything you need to run your podcast, and you can record and publish episodes directly from the app on your phone. It even allows you to splice files together if you need to. It's really great. Download the free Podbean app today. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N. Then head on over to Podbean at www.podbean.com and use the code PODCAST21, that's PODCAST21, for your first 30 days of podcast hosting for free. Check it out! And now, on to today's episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. Hello, my friends and listeners. This is Aaron Odom from Trident Theater and come to you again for another episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. I want to just get right into this episode today because there's a lot to go over. As you know, I select my guests from either my personal experience with them or the idea that they bring something to the table as far as a perspective of the theatrical arts that is unique, or maybe we are just all part of a theatrical community, and that has a broad spectrum of people, from the absolute veterans to the amateurs who are on the front lines. And today, my guest, and I'm no negative connotation to the word amateur, is in that latter category. My guest today is a a current theater student. He has been a student of mine, but we've worked together on several projects in the past. Since I first met him in high school, has done a plethora of shows since then, all within our little community of Sheridan, Wyoming. And this has developed into something we're going to talk about here in just a moment, where he's really expanding his resume into the film world still here within Sheridan, Wyoming. My friends and listeners, this is David Britton. Hello, David. How's it going, Aaron? Hey, hey. And I got to, you know, since this is an audio format, I got to thank you. You are wearing an Ultimate Warrior t-shirt today. (laughs) And I have to say, I take particular pleasure in the fact that you have guided me and my sons through the fascinating theatrical world of WWE. We all know it's sports entertainment, but yeah, I mean, those guys are amazing. So thank you for showing me that realm of theatricality. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're, I mean, no problem. Like uh, last night, my dad and I was watching wrestling and something happened where we both didn't think it happened and we just went absolutely bananas. Like, oh my God, we can't believe that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, wrestling's great. I love it, honestly. Well, and, and it is its own particular form of theatricality. Like, you know, people take things so seriously that, that, you know, something like that, which we go in knowing. Like there's a hint of, we know that this isn't 100% legitimate. We know that. Yeah. But we still watch it Mm -hmm. like with absolute anticipation and expectation. Like, you know, this is exactly, (laughs) I'm going to have people write me after this and be like, no, it's not. Uh, (laughs) This is exactly what people were going through watching Oedipus, like feel the, (laughs) the, the downfall of, 
oh my god the sphinx was right ah you know it's i mean <laughs> it is it's kind of on the same level really so yeah anyway awesome so as i hinted earlier yeah you're still a student you're finishing up it sounds like you're you're planning on heading into the direction of teaching history with uh having a theater background as well so that you can help students who are in your situation yeah 100 percent. you know i kind of fell in love at aaron as you know i wasn't the best student out there and i kind of just <laughs> fell in love teaching kind of like late into this whole college thing where I was like, you know, maybe I actually want to do it. Then it was like, I actually really want to teach kids and like show them there's much more to history and theater than meets the eye or meets the ear or whatever. So, right. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. That's great. Now, as I hinted before we, we uh, started getting into other stuff like wrestling and everything, uh, you are really expanding your repertoire. I'd say you've done probably at least 20 to 25 plays here in the Sheridan community within the last few years. Have I? Yeah. And then wow. <laughs> you are, you, I, I got you right now before you were ready to head off for like a week-long project up in the mountains. So, so tell me a little bit about that. There's a wonderful director his name is jeffrey jonathan we're going to be filming a movie called grizzly debt and it's about this cracked out grizzly bear that's <laughs> rampaging throughout the big horn <laughs> big as horn grizzly forest. bears tend to do <laughs> oh yeah you know you know just normal wednesday honestly and um yeah we're taking a whole week into the mountains filming this so it, it should be a great time mm -hmm. this is this isn't the first time you've worked on on a project with jeffrey though right no, this, this is my second time. Uh, the first time, equally great cast, great thing. Um, that's called Dissolution of Death. I believe he's almost done editing it. He, and he directs, edits, and acts in all of his movies, which is, takes time. And he's, he's a really great editor and actor and director. You know, I play like as I think I was taking your class and I had to shave off cybers my whole. Oh yeah, I looked, I looked like I was twelve the whole time. But it was it was a great movie. It's it's turning out so great. I saw a couple videos and I'm going to be part of it in a commercial for his for his film and it's going to be great. I honestly nice. kind of love that one. Yeah, and like he kind of just wants to be like, hey, you can actually shoot movies and film movies here in Sheridan of all places. Right, you know? right, right. Regardless of like the widespread distribution or the, mm -hmm. the constantly hawking it, it's there. It might get picked up sometime. There are tons of places out there right now that are picking up small independent film. They might look at one of those and go, yeah, let's throw it on our platform. I think that's amazing. That's awesome. That's I mean, awesome. hopefully that happens. <laughs> 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 All right. Awesome. Well, let's get down to business here. Oh, man. When I first heard about this story, I, I so wanted to get into it. There are going to be people who might listen to this and go, yeah, but you didn't hit on. And I'm like, look, I'll, I'll hit the highlights here, okay? But I usually start these with a question, David. And and the reason I had you come on this is because I think you're getting quite a uh, an interest in being a professional or at least understanding what it means to be a theatrical professional or a film professional. So right. my question, it's actually a two-part question here. What makes a production successful? Oh gosh. Oh um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean that could be a list, a list of things. I mean to make a production successful, I guess you just need everyone to do their right job and do it correctly or at least okay. correctly enough where um, it kind of just meshes together to create like a wonderful film or play or whatever you're trying to. So there's an element of teamwork there. Like, yeah, 100%. Like, and, and, and with teamwork, like that seems to denote like an, the idea of like mutual respect. So let me ask you this. Is it more important to be financially successful or for the work to have artistic merit? Oh, man. <laughs> Coming out I, swinging here. I... <laughs> I mean, obviously, like both both are important, but mm -hmm. I feel like, and it hurt. It probably sucks to say this. I feel like more financially, if you're okay. financially there, then you might be able to get it out more than ah, as opposed yeah, to if okay. you had a great production and a great movie with a whole mm -hmm. bunch of people in it, but you can't really don't have the money to get it out anywhere. Right, right. With that in mind. With the idea of, you know, you can't have artistic success without financial success in a lot of cases. We're going to go right into this. 
There are some names that resound through Broadway history like a constant echo on the Great White Way. Names like Ziegfeld, Hamlish, Sondheim, and Rodgers and Hammerstein, to name a few. These names are synonymous with significant Broadway success and innovation. However, one name sticks out as legendary. A man who may have been the most significant producer Broadway has ever seen. Throughout the several decades of his career, there were times when he would have five shows on Broadway at a time and several more in production. It has been said that during the high points of his career, that an estimated 20% of all employees working on Broadway at the time were working on one of his shows. <laughs> <laughs> I control one fifth of the workforce. A producer almost as well known for his success as much for his notoriety. It cannot be argued that David Merrick is one of the names that will forever be welded to what it means to succeed on Broadway and how the Broadway business is run. Now, do you know anything about David Merrick? The name sounds familiar. Right. Like it's one but... we should know, right? It sounds like a common name, like other than the first name, but it sounds like just a common name I've heard like recently. I'm just trying to like pinpoint where. <laughs> okay, now, David Merrick was actually a name he adopted later in life. He had another name when he was born. So I'm going to refer to him as David for the first little bit of this. So every time I say that, you don't have to just constantly like be like, hey, what? Like I'm talking <laughs> to you, okay? From a very young age, David always made it known that he wanted to be successful. To him, this meant material wealth, but he had artistic inclinations as well. But this desire to be successful comes from his quite humble beginnings. On November 27th, 1911, David was born in St. Louis, Missouri to Sam and Celia Margulis, Russian Jewish immigrants. David was the youngest of five children, the next youngest to him being at least 10 years his senior. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I think you're the youngest of your family, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and but and you have some older siblings, but they're not like ten years older, right? Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> actually, my my brother, he's he's in his around his mid forties. Oh, whoa! Yeah. Okay, and um, you're in like your late twenties, right? Yeah. So, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm 27, almost 28. Okay. Okay. So so you can I, uh, relate to this a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Now, his parents, Sam and Celia, their marriage was not necessarily one that was founded on love. As is customary in many Jewish shtetl, the shtetl is a small community of Jewish people in a single town or a community within a larger city, the village matchmaker arranged the marriage between Sam and Celia before they emigrated to America. And Sam and Celia had not come from families of significant wealth, but were rather quite poor. This is one of the many factors in their youngest son's desire to seek fame. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> now, in addition, Sam and Celia were a little late to the immigration party. Unfortunately, they sought refuge in America due to a considerable wave of anti-Semitism that swept through Eastern Europe and Russia in the late 19th century. Many other Jews from Europe had emigrated much earlier in the century and were able to establish businesses and find their own successes. So Sam and Celia found themselves at the bottom of their ethnic group when settling in St. Louis. This obviously put a strain on their already fragile marriage. Celia had been known to have a history with mental health problems and was prone to fits of extreme emotion. Like, whatever emotion she was feeling, it was always dialed to 11. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> that person is hard to be around. <laughs> <laughs> Sam found work as a door-to-door -door salesman, and possibly to avoid his wife's visceral outbursts, he stayed at work as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> when he was at home, things were dicey. Later in life, David would describe their marriage as, quote, growing up on the set of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Now, as you may recall, <laughs> Edward Albee's play is a scathing criticism of marriage in which the institution of marriage is depicted as a battleground of wits that often turns physically or sexually violent or both. <laughs> <laughs> Sam and Celia divorced when David was seven, and David was tossed around for years between two of his older married sisters who treated David as quite the burden. <laughs> there, oh, no. was, there was one story I heard where he felt just terrible like and it just made his hatred of family life grow even more when he overheard one of his sisters like look he came for us to six months in the spring now it's your turn 
Oh gosh. <laughs> and and it's not like he was getting himself in trouble or anything. It was just frankly, it was another mouth to feed at a difficult time in the world. So yeah, I mean yeah. I, I get it, but I get uh, it, but tough love, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Finally, David went to live with his sister Sadie and her husband Sam. And Sadie was nearly 20 years older than David. And this actually worked out in his favor, as this gave him some idea of family stability. Like Sadie didn't necessarily act like a surrogate mother, but they had a pretty stable household. So it was just kind of nice to not have that friction anymore. Yeah, I'm sure that, that's great for him. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> but much of the damage had already been done. Mm. Although later in life, David had been known to express a modicum of sympathy for his mother, who was addled in the brain, as she was eventually committed to a mental institution where she would eventually spend the rest of her life. Oh, man. He developed an anger so strong for everything that they were. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> he did everything he could do to denounce his Jewish heritage, as he not only associated it with poor family values, but also with poverty. He even refused to speak Yiddish, which was a common tongue in many of the Jewish communities, like the ones the Margulis family had settled in, because mm -hmm. he associated it also with poverty. Oh, man. That, <laughs> that's... Like, this is a birth of, like, a supervillain almost. <laughs> Ah, you're not entirely wrong. Oh, man. <laughs> Refuses to talk in Yiddish. Woo! Oh, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> and like many Jews of his generation, David, quote, placed a heavy value on success. They sought to create a huge financial gap between themselves and their origins. This contempt for Jewish culture appeared here and there throughout his career. <laughs> oh, God, I love this. Quote, the morning after Fiddler on the Roof opened, he was walking through the theater district with an associate who pointed to a line of ticket buyers extending from the Imperial Theater going all the way to Broadway and around the corner. Now, that oh, is a long block. That is a, That's a very, long ass line. <laughs> yes, yes. They were so, they're getting their tickets to go see the show. Mm -hmm. David was unimpressed. It's a Jewish show, he said. No one will go. Wait, was he? He saw the line, right? He saw the line. <laughs> no, they're they're actually going for King Kong, David. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not going to premiere here for another forty-five years. <laughs> Here's another quote. He used the Yiddish word for ugly. He used a Yiddish word for ugly, miskite, to describe a young auditioner to whom he took an immediate dislike. Uh -huh. This auditioner was Barbara Streisand. Oh, <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, he, he, he had a thing against uh, anything Jewish. Okay. Wow. Now, under the watch of his sister Sadie, David was able to achieve academically and found himself enjoying theater quite a bit in high school. He was involved in quite a few extracurricular activities and was class president during his senior year. Despite this, he was often described as lonely and introverted. He had only had a few close friends and never really had a girlfriend. But it was in high school where he developed the method of dress that would be associated with David for the rest of his life. The three-piece pinstripe suit. A zoot suit, basically, right? Basically, yeah, but like <laughs> not not the super long tails, the big yeah. hat or anything. It's just, you know, it's like three pieces, the vest, the jacket, the, the pants wow. in high school. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, while this did help him to promote an image of wealth and success that was associated with him for most of his adult life, it also acted as a system of warmth as David suffered from low, pre low blood pressure for most of his life. Mm, okay. So, you know, like you see those guys, you're like three piece suit in the middle of July in New York. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although he achieved academically, David earned no scholarships for college, but enrolled in Washington University in St. Louis anyway. In order to pay for this, David worked tirelessly outside of school in a bevy of different jobs to be able to pay his way. Now, while this scrimping for every dollar he could muster was a behavior he associated with his father, therefore he chose to study law as it most likely would lead to a path of wealth, no matter what. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> you can't Eventually, argue it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Why are you studying law? Because my dad just sucked, okay? Leave me alone. <laughs> he was a poor son of a bitch. 
However, during his junior year in college, this tireless pace of work and school deteriorated his health to the point that he had to drop out. David developed an ulcer by the time he was 30, which prevented him from being drafted in World War II. He returned to college and earned a Bachelor of Law degree in 1937, but this time at the less costly St. Louis University. He entered law school thereafter and graduated with ease in the top third of his class. But here's a quote. A classmate later suggested he might have done better had he had any genuine interest in the law. But the law was merely a means to an end. He would spend the rest of his life manipulating it to his own purposes. Oh. <laughs> so, what were you saying about supervillain earlier? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, one way is coming up here in just a second. Now, while he was attending law school, he was somewhat casually dating Leonore Beck, who lived with her widowed mother in a fancier suburb of University City. Both David and Leonore were known to be somewhat reserved and shy, but Leonore was something of a prize as her father had made a significant amount of money with his cooperage firm. Mm. This worked out quite well for David, according to the accounts of a few of his classmates. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I love that yeah. you made this allusion to a supervillain. Oh, that's all I'm thinking of now. <laughs> okay. Well, well. Here, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Quote, Dave made no bones about the fact that he was intending to marry the Beck girl for her money. I don't think he had too much regard for her as a woman. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and, another, and another remembered Lanor's docility. She, quote, gave in to everything Dave suggested. <laughs> I mean, it's Joker and Gosh. Harley Quinn, right? It, it's it Joker basically... and Harley. <laughs> <laughs> oh I mean, my. Whatever girl Lex Luthor has on his arm, this is her. Okay? Oh, jeez. But David did not marry her right away. There was a little speed bump to betrothal in the form of Leonor's mother. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, can you imagine? She detested David. <laughs> <laughs> gee i wonder why <laughs> she wouldn't let him in the house when he came to pick her up for dates he had to be out on the street and honk the car horn to get her to come out mrs beck knew that david had an interest in pursuing a career in theater which she thought would not meet the financial needs of her daughter mm. frankly she knew that david was only interested in her daughter for the prospect of money but mrs beck was in poor health as well, and probably would have put up more of a fight to get her daughter to shake herself free from David had her health not been so bad. Okay, okay here's the timeline. In June 1937, Mrs. Beck died. Her will left the entire estate to Leonor. $116,319.66, which today comes out to $2,205,251.12. Oh my gosh. David and Leonor married on January 16th, 1938, only six months later. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Holy cow. That's oh. a lot of money. You're right? Right? <laughs> and, 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 and I actually had to look it up. Cooperage is like, it's bottles and barrels and tubs. And, 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 and that's how he made his wealth. So anything that's part of that, like that's what he did. So that's and a lot of money. Basically like everything, right? Everything that's <laughs> Uh, oh, you gotta you gotta put something in something. I can take care of that. I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Having this newfound wealth, David now had the capital needed to begin his professional career. While he did graduate with a Juris Doctorate, he never officially practiced law, hmm. but rather used the law to his own advantage. Oh man! <laughs> For example. An attorney was assigned to manage the Beck estate from which this attorney earned a $5,000 annual fee. Okay, this is 1938, that's $5,000. That's a huge amount of money. Yeah. David didn't like this too much, so David petitioned to the court to have the fee repaid. He was denied. <laughs> yeah, so, I hope so. <laughs> so his next tactic was to have the entirety of the estate turned over to the care of his wife. Mm. Oh, well, this time the court agreed, and David managed to manage the estate from then on. Of course. <laughs> of course. Saved, him, saved himself 5000 a year. You just got $2 million. Uh, <laughs> Oh, gosh. This man. Yeah. Oh, oh, it gets so much worse, David. 
Here we go. Oh, no. <laughs> Before reaching New York in 1940, there were some other ventures the newlyweds tried. They did, of course, celebrate their honeymoon in the resorts of Mexico. Now, David had wanted to try his hand in the film business, but couldn't enough muster enough steam for himself. Plus, he just he didn't like the the whole creative process of the film world. For him, it just it didn't do what he wanted it to do. Now, meanwhile, the couple tried to live as newlyweds or at least roommates. Leonor tried to fill the role of housewife to varying degrees of success, having very little help in this role from her mother. Quote, once when they lived in Hollywood, Leonor cooked fish for the first time. It looked beautiful, but when her husband took his first bite, he intoned, this is not cooked. She then realized that she had only cooked one side. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> rookie mistake, honestly. <laughs> like. Yeah, uh, first chink in the armor. Uh, <laughs> just, just sushi, man. That's all it is. Roll it up. It's fine. Yeah, just, just roll it up. <laughs> After another failed attempt to break into producing summer theater in the state of Maine, David realized that he was probably chasing the wrong prize. After all, he wanted to be successful in theater, and the best money in theater was to be made in New York City. The couple then finally relocated there in 1939. Oh, I think I said 1940 earlier. No, they got there in 1939. The state of Broadway at the time was somewhat ambiguous. While the war was raging overseas, many theaters stayed open on Broadway and were attended with some regularity, despite the fact that critics often declared the impending death of Broadway in print. <laughs> Jeez. Like they consistently were just like, oh, it's any day now. It's just going to go right down the tubes. <laughs> I mean, it's been dying for 2,500 years, hasn't it? And still here. Uh, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> By the summer of 1940, David felt bold enough to march into the office of Herman Shumlin, who was a producer, and he offered to invest $5,000 into a play called The Male Animal. The show was a financial success. And for the next 10 years or so, David would work for Shumlin. And by success, I want to say, a lot of times for the rest of this episode, when I talk about success, I want to say it made money. Yeah, it made you a know, profit, right? It at least made a profit, right? Okay. So here's this young guy comes in, looks at the producer, says, hey, I want to put some money into this and I want to help you get it on, on its feet. And it worked. And then they were partners, kind of, or at least Shumlin was his mentor in a way. Okay. Now, it was after the success of The Male Animal that David changed his name for a couple of reasons. First of all, he could already feel his star rising, and he felt that he would need a name that suggested success. But mostly, this was to shake the Jewish sound from his given surname, Margulis, and avoid any anti-Semitism that might come with it. This is also his way of removing any hint of the humble and detestable upbringing he felt he had. So he chose the name Merrick. M-E-R-R-I-C-K, modeled after the very successful 18th century British actor, David Garrick, mm. G-A-R-R-I-C-K. <laughs> and to be fair, in my personal opinion on this, it was just a little underhanded. I mean, that would, that would be like me changing my name to Tom Pruse. <laughs> right <laughs> the sounds already have an air of success and entertainment i would just be writing the coattails mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's like kind of like almost slimy like hmm interesting you <sighs> said that hmm. uh oh as i said before merrick worked under shumlin throughout the 1940s as i also said before he was excused from the military service due to his ulcers but it was during his early years as a producer that merrick developed the signature feather in his cap and pretty much the focus of the rest of this episode, the publicity stunt. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, I mean, <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, we see he's been a little underhanded. He may have like something of an origin to this. Like, okay, I see that you feel that this is the way to communicate with people, but oh boy. <laughs> oh, man. Now, for his first production on his own, a little-known non-musical called Mr. Clutterbuck, that was his first show. And that was, he produced that in 1949. At that time, if you were a tourist in the New York area or in just anywhere, hotels didn't really have TV sets then. TV wasn't a mm -hmm. huge thing then. So your room was actually a little bit smaller. It was there basically for you to get dressed, to go to sleep, to clean up, you know, etc. Okay. Right. The main entertainment of a hotel then was hanging out in the lobby, 
which was for New York hotels was vastly ornate or it might mm-hmm. be themed or something like that, or the hotel bar. Okay. Now, Merrick, Merrick knew this really, really well. So like I said, the play is named Mr. Clutterbuck. What he would do to get people interested in just the name several times a night, he would call all the big fancy hotels and all the big fancy lobbies and the bars in New York City and have Mr. Clutterbuck paged. so yeah there's some concierge who's like oh yes i will talk to mr clutterbuck and has to announce like over a loudspeaker or just you know out in loud voice over everybody in the lobby or the bar mr clutterbuck mr clutterbuck please mr clutterbuck has a phone call and they'd say it over and over and over again and everybody would hear the thing then they'd see the ad for the play and they go oh Oh, that's what they're talking about. <laughs> Could you imagine if someone like actually had the last name or Clutterbuck and just was like, oh, that's me, and walks up to the front? <laughs> <laughs> and then, then he has to call him. <laughs> and he's like, I heard you page me. No, I didn't. Piss off. <laughs> now, this gave Merrick the idea of like producing on a larger scale because he always loved the idea of Ziegfeld, Flo Ziegfeld in his follies, you know, the like big brass bands and, and a dancing troupe and singers and amazing costumes. It was just his idea of what Broadway could be, you know, it was like ultimate family entertainment, but family entertainment also means you have to get several tickets per party. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sometimes when he was asked about, his date of birth, he would say, I first came alive the night Fanny opened. So Fanny, Fanny was his first big musical. Mm. Okay. And now the thing about David, uh, uh, about Merrick, that was really cool was he was always thinking. Mm -hmm. Like he was always coming up with an idea that nobody else really would. Other people at the time would come up with like, okay, so Oklahoma was popular. What could we do like Oklahoma? Or people really enjoy South Pacific. So what was it about South Pacific they enjoyed that we could put into our shows? What Merrick sought to do was find interesting ideas that really hadn't been done before that might attract a crowd. So Fanny was actually the first in a series of, I think it was three films, Uh, by a French director about a woman living on the French Riviera in Paris. And it was kind of in a love triangle. So it was like almost kind of like a soap opera, but you know, you're Mm -hmm. really cheering for this woman. She, I mean, I kind of equate it today to like a Bridget Jones diary kind of thing. Like she's plucky and smart and funny and cute and everything, but she's fairly independent, but she's got these two guys. So, Hey, who wouldn't go see that show? That's a fun show. Okay. That's a great show. Right. So Merrick, really wanted to get Rodgers and Hammerstein to do the score. Mm. They looked at the project and they went, well, this is not really kind of the thing we do. And that led to a lifelong feud between Merrick and Rodgers. (laughs) This man, he is very (laughs) eventual, isn't he? Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Oh, you ain't going to work with me? No, 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 no. I'm not going to work with you. (laughs) He's he's totally the guy that would be like, Oh, sorry, man. I got to let you go. You can't let me go. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> you can't quit. You haven't even been hired. Um, so, yeah. So, eventually, he got uh, Broadway legend Joshua Logan to direct. And they were actually friends, uh, or at least, you know, uh, positive accomplices for right. the rest of their lives. Uh, and he got the big name uh, uh, at the time, Ezio Pinza, to star. It was a name you could put on a poster and people would come. Now, hmm. Merrick also employed, and I don't know how to pronounce this, I, I'm probably going to screw it up, Nela Ates. She was a famous belly dancer and a tabloid subject because she had been suggested to be linked to several of New York's elite. And whether she was or not, we don't know. All we know is she was attractive, or at least considered conventionally attractive, and like I said, is a belly dancer. So oftentimes, flesh would be seen (laughs) oh well he gave her a major dancing role in the production and put her up on the poster as well oh of course you know (laughs) of course (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, that's kind of like, let's see, who's like a big actor right now? Okay, so let's say, okay, we'll just go back to him. I brought him up a couple episodes ago, like Chris Hemsworth. Okay, right. Chris Hemsworth's going to be in this show with Pamela Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how I equate it here. Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> sums it up well. perfectly almost. Yeah, okay. So in order to get this show promoted, I mean, David Merrick was actually pretty innovative in this. Like he took out radio and TV ads at a time when those things weren't really being done for theater. Fanny was the first show that he took out a full page ad in most of the papers, full page color ad, which is huge money at the time. Mm -hmm. And and that became something that was known for his productions for the rest of his career. Like once, once the full page ad comes out, you know a David Merrick show is coming and that's, it's going to be a big deal. However, to drive things even further and to get people who might not be part of the theater going community, David had a couple little tricks up his sleeve. Okay. <laughs> One of them was to post small little signs, almost like little stickers on the walls in men's bathrooms that said, have you seen Fanny? Now, okay. for those of you that don't understand like your slang terms, in American slang, Fanny usually refers to the backside. And in British and UK and Scottish and everything, it refers to the women's private parts. Mm -hmm. So putting this up all over in men's bathrooms, all over, got it in people's minds to just keep thinking of the word Fanny. <laughs> Oh man, can, can you imagine this like, this worker from somewhere comes home like, hey, what you doing this day? I saw a sticker on a bathroom stall about something. Yeah, what was it about? Oh, I, oh, uh, really, uh, I shouldn't have even brought it up. Uh, it's, uh, what's for dinner? Um, <laughs> now, on top of this, as a further publicity stunt. So I talked about this, this belly dancer that mm -hmm. he employed. He commissioned a statue of her to be built. And not just oh, any wow. statue, but a nude statue. Oh. And under the cover of night, about two weeks or so before the play opened, had it placed in Central Park, where a lot of onlookers would be able to see it. After dawn, the next morning, he called the police to say, hey, somebody put up this lewd statue in the park. <laughs> oh, my Wow. <laughs> the press went right down to the park and watched the police remove the statue. And it was a, the talk of the town for a couple weeks. And then Merrick finally said, yeah, I did that. It's for the play, Fanny. Come see Fanny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Here's a quote. Publicity bred theater goers and Fanny made back its investment in a remarkably fast 17 weeks its entire investment and then ran nearly another two years. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> Merrick didn't even get the team he wanted. He actually mm -hmm. did. He was said he was kind of disappointed in the end result overall, but he had investment in it. He had money in it. So he had to make it back. Now right. uh, this continuing the quote, Thanks to a shrewd rental deal Mr. Merrick had extracted from the Schuberts for the Majestic Theater, Fanny was on a weekly basis the most profitable show in Broadway history up to that time. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> and this allowed him to launch into several other productions, including Thornton Wilder's The Matchmaker, which he would revisit many years later in the musical inspired by that play, Hello, Dolly. However... His Hello Dolly started to see some sinking ticket sales. So what he did was he fired the entire cast and recast it with African-American actors. This is in 1964 at the height of civil rights movement, knowing that it would sell tickets. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, I, and I don't even know how long it ran. I want to say it ran for quite a while. Wow. People loved it. They loved it. That's, yep. that's, that's brilliant in a really slimeball way. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like you did this amazing thing for the African-American community because nobody Honestly, would have thought of that at the time. Nobody no one else would have. 
Oh my god, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Where you're like, I really don't like why you did it, but I love that you did it. Honestly, Arr. holy cow. <laughs> okay, if you think that's good, I got a couple more before the granddaddy of them all. Uh oh. Okay. In 1957, he produced the Broadway production of a British play called Look Back in Anger. Now, uh, those of you in uh, who have studied theater history, Look Back in Anger is a pretty significant play. It's uh, part of a series of plays written by what came to be known as the Angry Young Men. They're these uh, 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 whole group of British playwrights who they really told a lot of stories about the frustrations of the working class and, and, you know, after World War II and into the 60s, uh, you know, you had a lot, of, a lot of people in the middle class who life just wasn't uh, what they thought it would be, okay? Right, right. And, of course, this play, Look Back in Anger, is a lot about marital strife, so there's lots of yelling. <laughs> <laughs> Four months after opening in 1957, ticket sales began to slump. One night during the play, the main actor is on stage berating his wife, the character is playing his wife for something or other and a woman in the house stands up storms down to the stage jumps on stage and slaps the actor across the face she couldn't stand it anymore wow now i don't know what happened to her afterwards i don't know if the production stopped i don't know like she was probably like a stagehand came out and grabbed her and just escorted her off right right the story was all over papers for three weeks until merrick fessed up that he had hired the woman to do that for $250, which would just be a little over $2,400 today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It is still not known if the actors or anyone else involved was in on the stunt. The production then ran for another 15 months on Broadway. <laughs> wow. Just the minute ticket sales goes down, this guy's like, all right, we got to figure out something. <laughs> all right, can, what, what can we do? Can, can we assassinate somebody on stage? Oh, wait, wait. No, 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 no. That happened once. That, it didn't work out. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All right. Here we go. In 1961, he produced a little original musical called Subways are for sleeping. This whole musical was based on an article in a recent newspaper about the homelessness situation in the New York City subway system. When the play eventually opened, it got pretty universally panned by critics, and it didn't really have a great ad campaign in the first place. Merrick actually wanted to put ads all over the subway system, but the city wouldn't allow it. They thought it would just inspire more homeless to go down into the subways and sleep. The title is Missed subway. Opportunity, man. Missed Opportunity. Come on. Come on. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, come on. Yeah, subway's ever sleeping. Oh, look, see, there he is right there. This homeless guy sleeping right there. We ought to go see that show. <laughs> now, at the time, the names of Broadway critics were almost as important as the cast and production teams of Broadway shows at the time. Now, one such writer, Walter Kerr, currently has a Broadway theater named after him. So if you need to know how important Broadway critics have been in the history of Broadway, there's an example. Okay? Merrick and his publicist turned to the phone book. Now, I've said okay. that. What, what do you think they might be doing? I'm assuming looking for... A critic of some sorts. Hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. They scoured the country for people with the same names as the top critics in the New York City theater scene. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. He paid for them to be flown to New York City where he wined and dined them and then gave them great seats for the show. Before they left, they had headshots made for a series of ads that Merrick would put out. He had them sign a contract and paid them that they had honestly said great things about the show, like this is one of the best new musicals in Broadway history, basically saying that all the critics love the play. The pictures were then added to the ad because who knows what the critics look like? <laughs> that is... Wow, that's great. All newspapers but one rejected the ad. Oh. And it ran for a week before it was removed. <laughs> the publicity caused the play to run for several more months 
and it at least garnered a small profit. Yeah, there we go. I mean, Merrick was actually known, even from a young age, to like bet at dog races and small gambling things and stuff. He always made a bet. It was never a huge bet, and he always made money. Mm, I see. Okay. Always. So it's like, you know, in, in dog races, y- you can bet on the winner, but you can also right. bet on like, you can bet on them to show, which means they come in first, second, or third. And if they right, if right, they right. get into that, you might get a small bet back. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it's not a huge return on your money. No. But he figured out how. <laughs> now, <clears throat> okay, here we go. We're getting into the big one here. Uh-oh. Through the 50s and 60s, Merrick was arguably the most successful, if not the most busy producer on Broadway, producing both musicals and non-musicals alike. However, he developed a nasty reputation. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I couldn't imagine why. Why? He's so crazy. <laughs> Despite his ability to spin straw into gold, his behavior in person was terrible. First of all, he despised actors often referring to them as, quote, unruly children. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. He never really became friendly with the other producers on Broadway, often stating that they lacked creativity or innovation. He is quite well known for quoting, there's a horse's ass for every light on Broadway. (laughs) And it eventually made it into a play we're going to talk about here in a moment. He would often concoct hostile work environments, pitting members of his creative teams against each other, basically falsely raising the stakes of the production. So like he might call the the music director and be like, you know, I don't think the choreographer is really meeting what you need to do. You know, you're writing this good stuff and they're not taking the bait on it. And the, the music director would be like, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, your support. Then he'd call the choreographer, being like, that musical director's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd get together the next day and just be like real tense. And, and they know, okay, we got to get through this thing together and we're going to work on it. <sighs> so that, but, but he knew that it heightened the tension of the production, which heightened the stakes, which made them right. work harder. Right. <laughs> That's... You know, that, that happens a lot outside of theater. And like, okay. it happens a lot. Like, I've heard stories of it happening just like, you know, at a random like mom and pop shop, maybe or something where they're like, well, you know, they didn't say it was the <laughs> best food I, they ever had. And <laughs> the next time you go there, it's probably like <laughs> best meal you ever had or something. Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, the 70s was a rough time for Merrick. His mm-hmm. tactics by then were well known. And the type of shows he liked to produce were waning in popularity, particularly with musicals. As I've said before, Merrick loved the glitz and glamour of the Ziegfeld Follies, and those sentiments can be seen in many of the musicals he produced in the 50s and 60s. But in the 70s, the rock musical came out of nowhere to steal a lot of the spotlight, and creeping up just behind it, the British invasion of romantic musicals. The latter would be quite antithetical to the star-driven vehicle of the American musical, and Merrick really didn't know what to do. Hmm. In 1980, he found his big shot. He came up with the idea of adapting the 1933 film 42nd Street into a big Broadway musical. Okay. Have you heard the stories of 42nd Street? I've heard a few. Oh, yeah? What have you heard? Yeah. I mean, basically what you just said, like, it was popular in the 1930s, and some guy Mm -hmm. tried to make it more popular. Apparently it was David Merrick. Yep. uh, In the 80s. But that's basically, like, all I've heard Yeah, yeah. You know, I talk about the plot of this in episode three, The Deuce. So you can go back and listen to that and, and you'll get kind of the plot of it. But really it's 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 a kind of a show within a show thing. Uh, you have this whole crew of actors and musicians and dancers who uh, it's set in the in the Great Depression. And if this show doesn't work, they're all out of work right. and and they're they're done. I think one of the leading members of the cast has some money in the show and it's a huge thing for the director who's also the producer, his name is Julian Marsh. That was mm-hmm. the part I got to play. That was a really fun part. This was my, this was my big show in college and I have a lot, of, a lot of feeling for this. And as I was reading about David Merrick, I went, oh my God, they put so much of David Merrick into this character. And I didn't know that when I originally played it. And I'm like, holy <laughs> crap, I wanna play it again now. I wanna play it again. Anyway, so 
42nd Street featured direction and choreography from one of Merrick's longtime collaborators, director and choreographer Gower Champion. While the pair saw quite a bit of success in working with each other, the success could only be matched by the contempt the two men shared for each other while working together. Now, mm. off time, off time, they'd go out for dinner and they, you know go see shows and everything. But while they were working together, they were consistently at each other's throats, and it was a consistent power struggle. Jeez. One of Merrick's wives, he had four in a total of five marriages. He married one of them twice. One of <laughs> Merrick's wives was quoted as saying that whenever Merrick was working with Champion out of town, she would leave her knitting needles at home because she was afraid that one of them would use them to harm the other. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll take up crochet. I'll just do crochet. It's fine. <laughs> That's great. It's funny. Now, the musical had its out-of-town tryouts in Washington, D.C., and pre-production phase wasn't going well. Mm. Merrick demanded larger and more ornate set pieces that would just blow the socks off of anything that could be seen on Broadway at the time. He wanted the show to have such spectacle that it was just going to leave you in awe. I mean, this is the equivalent of having like this huge CGI budget for a big movie that shows you so many more things than you could have ever seen before. It's, it's the equivalent of bringing dinosaurs into Jurassic Park in 1993. Nobody else could have done that, right? Okay. okay. Yeah, right. That's what that's what he's doing. So there's like train, there's like train station sets. There's a set that's on a train. It's a huge show. He demanded a dance chorus of at least 24 members outside of just the cast members needed to tell the story. Hmm. By the time it had finally opened in Broadway, the $1.8 million budget eventually hit $3 million. The costume budget of $370,000 hit $500,000. Now, I didn't mention it earlier, but um, it was basically a musical filled of old Broadway songs. So they took a bunch of old musical tunes written by Harry Warren and Al Dubin and spliced them together to make a musical. Okay. okay. So you have songs like, um, well, I mean, uh, The Lullaby of Broadway. You have songs okay. like uh, We're in the Money. Yeah, we're okay. in the money. And then oh. and then the song Dames, which is kind of a throwback to old Broadway and the glitz and glamour and maybe a glamour of Hollywood as well, where these women would be just lavishly dressed, just be knockouts and have all kinds of amazing costuming. For the musical number Dames, in which the women appear on stage in a bevy of costumes, all evoking the sentiments of Broadway glamour, the wardrobe budget for that number alone was $52,000. Holy cow. <laughs> now, wow. that number that number That's also awesome. features like it also features uh like the broad the, the Broadway chorus of men in tuxes and canes and gloves right. and top hats and 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 you have about 10 of those guys on stage. So all of those plus all the costumes that women are wearing. You're basically yeah. just like <laughs> taking here, let's take Broadway costumes and go. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Now, while it was still in pre-production, investors began to balk, and they indicated that they would pull their interest from the show. That's when Merrick bought out their interests and removed them from the project. He had plenty of money to spare. <laughs> oh man this, oh. this guy oh you don't want to be part of it fine you have no idea how long this is going to be on broadway and really with merrick that's probably true right you have no idea. now not only that there was quite a bit of drama backstage <laughs> oh god you see it was quite well known that gower champion would always be having an affair with someone in the cast during rehearsal and production but usually it was a woman that was a little bit lower in the ranks this time he tried to convince Merrick that the woman he was currently sleeping with, a dancer named Wanda Reichert, should play the lead and that there should be no understudy in place. Merrick denied it. I mean, Wanda Reichert, she could sing, she could dance, she was attractive to look at, not necessarily leading lady material, according to Merrick, who, frankly, knew the business. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, I don't see why we're putting a lot of money into this girl that nobody knows about, even though that's what the play was about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> funny. So the two men were at loggerheads over the woman for quite some time until Merrick finally hired an understudy without champion's knowledge and then let her come to the theater 
and left her to make champion have to introduce her to the entire cast without knowing he was going to have to do so. Wow. And, and without the leading lady having any idea that it was happening either. Wow. Merrick <laughs> just, he had to convey the idea that he was in control. Yeah, he uh, really did, bit. didn't he? A little bit. <laughs> This, combined with a series of set rebuilds, scenes to be re-choreographed, etc., all of this added to the opening being delayed several times. Merrick usually would take out a full-page ad, like I was saying before. He would take it out in all papers to announce the opening, but this time it was being delayed. He tried to make it look like he had everything under control. He had this, he had this funny metaphor of, like, he basically was speaking to God, and when God would send him his messenger to open the show, then he'd do it. Until then, sit on your hats. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny it's great now this time fate had different plans oh you see gower champion was deathly ill oh no at first it looks like it was going to be a drawn out illness with an eventual cure champion was finally diagnosed with and i'm gonna mispronounce this voldenstrom macroglobally anemia oh geez, form, that's possible. it's a really rare form of blood cancer <sighs> and there was no cure at the time for yeah, no, that sucks. Now, none of the cast knew this, but they did know that he was sick. During their rehearsals in DC, the cast did rehearsal on stage when Champion demanded that the AC be turned off <laughs> because he was <laughs> getting chilled and the temperatures would get to over 100 degrees during rehearsal. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, you're, and this is a huge tap dance musical. These people are dying. Oh, uh, anyway. I I took tap dancing uh, last semester and it was like winter and it would be 20 degrees, but like no amount of it, it's <laughs> extremely physical. And you're just, by the end, you're just like one big sweat puddle leaving the dance studio. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and these are Broadway level performers. They are athletes right. in top shapes. So, and, and, and oh my God. honestly, so during all of this champion showed almost no signs of his illness other than, you know, being a little chilled every now and then and would direct with his usual flair. But during opening week, the story was different. On the morning of opening, August 25th, 1980, Merrick had received word that Champion had died. While Merrick was not with him when he died, he had been a constant presence at the hospital. One of his best friends was dying. And he often relayed to his assistants and publicity teams that he was somewhere else. So they wouldn't necessarily be lying when they were asked. Mm. So he got the word early in the morning. He sent word to the theater to have all of the cast get to the theater really early because they had to rehearse some scenes before opening so that they wouldn't be leaving the theater and hearing the news. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So they stayed in there all day. They got lunch ordered in. They got dinner ordered in. They stayed there. They were there the entire time. Wow. Okay. Later that day, after weeks of keeping the press out of the theater, all of a sudden, all manner of press was invited to opening night including TV crews. Oh. <laughs> oh. The red carpet was truly rolled out and all of Broadway royalty was there. The buzz on this show had been so significant because of the delays. Uh, there was one preview night that Merrick had scheduled and he only sent tickets to one ticket booth in town and then didn't tell anybody. So all of those ticket, those preview tickets didn't get used. And when the cast, op- the, the curtain opened, they saw an arrangement of like mannequins and stuffed animals out in the house. <laughs> he had arranged an audience for them. He said, you want an audience? You're getting an audience. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, everyone was there and they all wanted to see if Merrick still had the stuff. The curtain opened after the overture and only enough to see the entire dance crew from the knees down tap dancing for the first few bars of the show. And I got to tell you, the way that it was done when I did it, was uh, the, the person who directed it, his name is John Angstrom. He's probably directed it over a hundred times by now, but he was one of the original dance captains in this production on Broadway. Oh, and really? yeah, and he like has made a career out of preserving this vision of this show so so i mean you hear this really cool like brassy overture and everything with all those songs you know we're in the money Mm -hmm. all these great songs and then it gets the last few beats of the overture 
The curtain raises and all you see from wall to wall are tap dancing feet. <laughs> it was wow. so cool. Wow. So the crowd sees this, they go bananas and they're, and they continued their fervor for the rest of the production. I mean, it was just the, the choreography in this is just so incredible. Like after every number, you don't have any choice but to be clapping your hands and and in order to pull off a thing like this, you have to have dancers in incredible shape. So the right. men are absolutely dashing and handsome. The women are slim and trim and athletic, and they are just gorgeous. So you're just sitting there. It's eye candy like crazy. It's amazing, fun songs. There's no way you can't have a fun time at this musical. Right, right. Merrick, meanwhile, had himself protected away from view on the extreme side of House Right with a series of screens. He was still able to watch the entire production, but nobody could see him. After the final curtain call, there were 11. The audience demanded the curtain to be risen 11 times after the curtain call. Oh, 11 times. 11 times. Crazy. After the, after the 11th one, Merrick strolled out from his hideaway and indicated that he needed a spotlight on himself. The crowd got even louder. There he is, the man who did it. He made this amazing thing happen. He motioned for them all to quiet down and he folded his arms and kind of stirred up his face and the following transpired. I'm sorry I have to report, Merrick began. A roar went up from the house. Wow. No, no, he shouted. This is tragic. You don't understand. Gower Champion died this morning. Then Merrick crossed the stage to embrace the horrified Wanda Reichert, who had no idea that he had died and he's holding her there in his arms. The show's leading man, Jerry Orbach, screams off stage, bring it in, bring it in, meaning for the stagehand to shut the main curtain so the audience wouldn't have to watch the entire company descend into their grief. Wow. As you, as you can imagine, the publicity on this was, I mean, just viral. I mean, beyond oh, I'm, viral. I'm sure it was. Holy cow. This show ran for another nine years. Oh my gosh. Closed in 1989. Wow. So I'm going to read you a, a little thing here. And the main source of this episode is a book by uh, Howard Kissel called David Merrick, The Abominable Showman, which was his nickname throughout his entire career. Okay. But here's, uh, here's the thing. A few months after opening, Tammy Grimes, one of the stars of 42nd Street, asked Merrick if he realized that what he had done that night was, in the eyes of many, tasteless. He said he did. But he also knew it would create interest in 42nd Street on the part of millions who, who didn't particularly care or know much about theater. Quote, I couldn't resist, he said. End quote. Wow, let's... <laughs> <laughs> And and, yeah. and and even towards the end of its run, there were things that he did to extend the life of the show just a little bit longer. It probably would have closed in 87 or 88, but there were some things he did, just some strings he pulled, just a couple little things that let it go until 89. Hmm. Yep. Wow, this, this man. <laughs> Merrick suffered a stroke in 1983 and more or less lost his ability to speak. Hmm. He died on April 26, 2000 but produced several more shows between his stroke and his death. And I'm going to read you the end of his obituary from the New York Times. Oh, I'm sure it's great. <laughs> oh, oh, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Here we go. That lasting professional verdict still left unanswered for the question of motive, which had obsessed Broadway for decades. What made Merrick run? For all the money he earned and for all his efforts to keep every last dollar of it, there is no evidence he enjoyed his fortune. He lived furtively, often in unpretentious midtown apartments, and was not a party giver or goer, quite frequently spoke of being depressed. One friend recalled a rare occasion in the early 1970s when Mr. Merrick briefly let down his guard and explained why his enormous success had failed to lighten his spirit. I'll tell you what it's like to be number one, he said. I compare it to climbing Mount Everest. It's very difficult. Lives are lost along the way. You struggle and struggle, and finally you get up there. And guess what there is once you get up there? Snow and ice. And that is the story of David Merrick. Holy cow, this man. <laughs> like. Wow, right? 
here, I'll give you just a list of some of the shows that he produced. Okay. You know, yeah, we can talk about all day about, geez, I can't believe that this guy did these things. And, you know, he was so standoffish and he was reserved in his private life and everything. But um, let's see, Fanny, the matchmaker, Gypsy, Carnival, mm. Beckett, Oliver, oh. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore, Tennessee Williams, Hello Dolly, uh, let's see, Marat Saad, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and Promises, Promises in 1968. These are shows that I can't even tell you, like the number of Tonys he's won, the number of times he was nominated. Oftentimes he was nominated in the same category against himself. <laughs> I mean, he was just a powerhouse and gave us some of the best things that have ever come to Broadway. Yeah, I mean, this guy was brilliant what he did. On I mean, the other hand, like, you know, just this last year, we had things like the producer Scott Rudin. So when Moulin Rouge was on Broadway right before coronavirus hit and got shut down, the actress Karen Olivo was in uh, the, the lead role. And when it was announced they were coming back, she said, I will not be back if Scott Rudin is part of this. Now, Scott Rudin was a producer. And if you look him up, you can find all kinds of stories about him and his temper tantrums and uh. everything. But he gave us great stuff. But I mean, there are, there are t- <laughs> I, one story I read was uh, he was in, in uh, like, the break room of their office building or something like that. And somebody paged him and they said, Hey, the, uh, these producers from the certain company are here. And he's like, what? They weren't supposed to be here. Why didn't you tell me they were coming? They're like, well, I just did. And he had an assistant sitting next to him. She had ordered a baked potato, like a loaded baked potato from the restaurant. <laughs> he picked up the baked potato, hers, and threw it against the wall. <laughs> oh, geez. But Karen Olivo comes out in Moulin Rouge and says, that behavior is not appropriate and I don't need to be treated that way. So she quit the show. And then a whole bunch of other people came out and they're like, Scott Rudin needs to go. Mm. And he eventually did. He eventually stepped down, but like still didn't really address the behavior. Yeah. You know? So yeah. it's, it's such a, it's such it's a so weird, weird, like, I appreciate what you did. I don't know if I like you. You, <laughs> you. I don't know that you did it for the right reasons. Yeah. Like we were talking about with, with that production of Hello, Dolly. You know, it was like, mm. what a cool and innovative thing and a great thing for Black actors at the time. Because, you know, here they're struggling to have their voices heard. Here they're struggling to have respect in the theater. And now they got it, but it was only because ticket sales were going down. Yeah. Like... <sighs> I respect what he did, but I don't know if I respect how he got there necessarily. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, there are things that, that people can do. Like, yeah, I mean, sometimes people might say unsavory things, but it doesn't necessarily make him a terrible person. Right. However, as my 13-year-old will often relate to me as we're watching a Star Wars movie, he does not buy the redemption of Darth Vader at the end of the series. Oh, sorry, spoilers. If you haven't seen the original Star Wars trilogy, Darth Vader dies at the end by sacrificing himself and killing the Emperor. But every time uh, my, my older son is like, come on, one act of redemption doesn't like wipe out everything else that he did. And I'm like, uh, you're right. <laughs> That's that's I just had a conversation with someone. So you know the Miz from WWE, right? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. My whole life I knew him as a heel, as like a disgusting person, right? And then all right. of a sudden he tries to turn face a good guy, and I'm just like, Yeah, I can't. I can't like him because <laughs> I, can't, I can't buy that, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, taking it back to wrestling, I saw a really cool video several years ago where somebody justified his appreciation for the art of big box professional wrestling mm -hmm. by saying, you know, the way that you can appreciate this is by following character and by following yeah. th them through their entire life cycle. And he, uh, he did it through the career of Triple H. Mm, okay. And, you know, there were rises and falls and there were switching from one side to the other and at the end of the day you still have to go this guy 
made such a significant contribution to the sport and the art that whatever side of the fence you're on, you can't deny that the contribution was significant. Yeah. Like, and, honestly, with a guy like Triple H too. And a guy like David Merrick. Mm-hmm. I mean, David Merrick was horrible to everyone he worked with, but it almost always worked. Yeah. Like, I just can't help but think like it all had to go back to like some psychological need to prove that he wouldn't be a failure. Yeah, that's, it's crazy. Whew. Wow. Well, what have we learned? We know not to treat people poorly, but try to, <laughs> but try to be successful at the same time. <laughs> All that story about Forty wow. Second Street just always is amazing to me. I've heard it said to me so many different times, and just the way he did it, he's like, "Nah, uh, Gower died," and goes over to the woman. Nah, I'm sorry. Just no, so nonchalant. I, I imagine it was probably nonchalantly too. Like, oh yeah, yeah this guy died. Yeah. And actually, one thing that's interesting about that is somebody asked him, like, what was your plan? When when were you going to do that? He said, I made my mind up at intermission. I mean, what was his plan before? Keep him locked into the theater? For- well, I mean, okay. <laughs> like, I, I can't remember... I can't remember much of the story of it, but same thing happened at Rent. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. the you know Jonathan Larson died. Like I think it was on the day it opened. Yeah, but I think, I, but I think, I think you're right. But I think everybody knew. I think you know yeah. he he had been sick. He had been uh, succumbing to the disease, and everybody knew like it was going to be there eventually. Mm-hmm. But in this case, nobody knew. They knew yeah. he was sick. They thought okay, he's got some kind of blood thing going on, but, you know, a couple transfusions, he'll get out of it. Yeah, no. he'll be fine. No, and Merrick knew, And but I'll say this. I'll say this before signing off. When he got to the theater that day, after finding out that Gower had died, he called one of the members of the creative team, Mark Bramble, he called one of the members of the creative team, and he said, come with me, we're going to go take a walk. And they get up on stage, and everybody's down in the dressing rooms or out in the front of the house or whatever, and so nobody's around them. And uh, Mark is like, hey, yeah, so what's going on? And David Merrick just collapsed in his arms and wept openly. And it's like, <laughs> Gower died, Gower died. I don't know what to do. I'm just, I'm just saying, my, one of my best friends is dead. And pulls himself together and looks at Bramble and goes, all right, nobody can know about this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, just Crazy. maintaining control of the whole situation the whole time. So, yeah. yep. That's the story of David Merrick, or at least most of it. I mean, there you can look it up. There are plenty of other weird little publicity stunts he did and plenty of ways that he managed the law in his favor. It's such a strange story. That book is a great thing to pick up, The Abominable Showman by uh, Howard Cassell. But in any case, yeah, there we go. How was that for you? Oh, that was amazing. That was, <laughs> that was an emotional roller coaster. Yep, yep, yep. See, just like wrestling. Woo! Yeah, just like wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my friends and listeners, that is another episode of Euripides Humanities. David Britton, thank you so much for being our guest today. I can see your reactions, but my God, they were palpable reactions. So, <laughs> um, But for those of you listening at home or listening afterwards, thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to have another episode here in another two weeks, and I will see you at intermission. <laughs>